Okay, today what we're going to look at is neuroscience and the behavior. This is chapter two of the David Myers 8th edition psychology textbook. So what we're looking at, remember, is when we look at neuroscience, we're looking at the brain and how it communicates and helps with our body. This is a really important unit when we look at AP psychology. You are going to hear all kinds of things that you need to connect. So when you read your exam, they might be talking about abnormal or they might be talking about sensation and perception, but you need to be able to pull it back to the stuff about the brain. So when we really look at the brain, what you guys um, need to understand is that over time our perception of the mind and the brain have kind of changed over time. So Plato, um, an ancient Greek, you know, he looked at our mind um, being in the brain. But his Aristotle, you know, his student, he said that the mind was in your heart. And so what we look at today is that the mind and the brain are pretty much the same kind of concept. It's the same thing. And so when we look at psychology, we need to also look at the biological parts of psychology. So Gall looked at the phenology part, and what he looked at was he looked at your brain um, as the bumps on your head. And so he tried to figure out what the different bumps on your head would actually represent. And so he thought that like certain parts of the bumps represented like uh, mentally unstable or, or all these different things. Now today we know that that's not true, but today we know it's not true due to all the new technologies that we have. We do look at the neurons, and the neurons are just our way of our body being able to communicate. So you need to know how a neuron looks. You need to be able to identify the different parts of it and what the purpose of a neuron and neural communication does for our body. And so neural communication is a biopsychosocial system. And when you look at this, our body always connects with everything. So the way our body is biologically made up affects our psychology and affects our social or society system. So when we look at neural communication, when we look at brains and brain size, um, brain size um, and association areas have a lot to do with how intelligent a person or an animal is. So you can see the more intelligent um, we get when we look at this, the more of uh, the larger the brain and the more association areas between those brain areas. So when we look at neurons, please make sure you know a neuron and the different parts. So we look at the cell. So the cell is the way the neuron actually maintains its life. It's the life support system of it. Um, and then when we look at dendrites, dendrites are like little hands that are reaching out to grab messages from other cells, from other neurons that are passing messages along. The axon is this part right here, and all the axon does is it passes a message away from the cell body to other neurons or muscles or glands throughout your body. And it passes it along through a neural impulse. And the neural impulse is just an electrical charge that travels down the axon. When you look at the very last part of the neuron, you've got two parts here. You've got the axon um, junction, which is the terminal um, part here. And what this does is it branches out and sends the message here. Then you have the myelin sheath. And all the myelin sheath does is it covers the axon and helps with the neural impulse. It helps speed it along. So remember when we did our BD neuron, the cell body, okay, it's life support, dendrites are reaching out and grabbing messages from other cells in our body. The axon, with the help of the myelin sheath, is going to speed along that message to the axon terminal, which is going to pass it along again. It's like a great big passing game. So remember like when you're in PE and you would pass the ball around? That is what our body does when it's during uh, neural communication. So here's just definitions of it. When we look at action potential, action potential is the neural impulse. And what this does is it's a charge, it's a brief charge, that's going to travel down your axon. And it's going to send that message along. So we look at depolarization and hyperpolarization. So depolarization occurs when positive ions enter the neuron, making it more prone to firing. So depolarization, positive ions, ions is going to make it more prone to actually firing. Hyperpolarization is when there's negative ions that enter the neuron and this makes it less prone to firing. So normally when we think of hyper we actually think of somebody who's like always ready to go kind of edgy but in this one it's kind of like the opposite. This one when it's hyperpolarization it's not likely to actually fire. It's less likely. 
depolarization, it's more prone to firing. Um, threshold, and we look at this in like five and six with sensation and perception. Threshold is each neuron receives depolarizing and hyperpolarizing currents from many of our neurons. When the depolarizing currents, the positive ions, minus the hyperpolarizing current, negative ions, exceeds the minimum intensity, that's your threshold, the neuron fires an action potential. All you need to know on threshold is that what's going to end up happening is, is once it reaches what it needs to, it will fire. So after a neuron fires, there's a refractory period, and the refractory period is just, um, it's just like a recharge period. And when the um, neuron needs to recharge, it's got to go through the whole process all over again. Now sodium potassium pumps, and this sodium potassium pumps the positive ions out of, from the inside of the neuron, making them ready for another action potential. So once it rests, the sodium potassium pumps is going to be able to kick in, and that's going to get it ready for another action potential for the neuron to fire off again. All or none response. Either the neuron's going to fire or it's not going to fire. Um, and the intensity of the action potential remains the same throughout the length of the axon. So it's kind of like a gun. You can keep pulling on that trigger as hard as you want, but it's not going to make the gun fire any faster than it would at any other point. So this is just when you're looking at all or none. Either it's going to happen or it's not going to happen. A synapsis is just the junction between the axon tip of the sending neuron and the dendrite or cell body of the receiving one. So that's that synaptic gap or the axon terminal here. So what you're seeing is, is that it's just passing it along. And it's the synapsis, it's the junction. So neurotransmitters, this is the stuff that you guys really need to make certain you know on neurotransmitters. You need to know each one of them and what they do and what happens if there's an excess or not enough of them in your body. So neurotransmitters are just chemicals that are being released throughout our body and they send messages throughout our body and it can um, make us different. Uh, because when we're looking at neuroscience, um, neuroscientists try and figure out how our body is changing our psychology and it's changing our society, our environment. So when we look at a reuptake, neurotransmitters in the synapses are reabsorbed into the sending neuron through the process of reuptake. This is just like a break on the neurotransmitter action. action. So if like um, the other one, the one that's supposed to act, the neuron that's supposed to be receiving doesn't want to, this is going to be the break, and so the message is going to be sent back. It's like uh, return the sender through your mail. So how neurotransmitters influence us, we look at serotonin. Make sure that you know serotonin is um, along with mood disorders. Uh, we'll look at it here in just a few minutes, but make sure you know serotonin helps with mood regulation. Dopamine is typically going to be associated with schizophrenia and Parkinson's disease, um, and you need to know both of those. If there's too much of it, we, we will see schizophrenia. If there's not enough of it, we will see Parkinson's disease. So make sure you know this chart. Um, I know you guys are trying to memorize it and everything, but this is a really important chart for neurotransmitters. So acetylcholine, ACH, is going to look at muscle action, learning, and memory. So if somebody doesn't have um, enough of this, like as we get older, this acetylcholine sometimes deteriorates. We can see Alzheimer's disease developing. Um, and so a lot of the Alzheimer's disease medicine, this is what it's trying to mimic. It tries to mimic acetylcholine to try and help um, alleviate the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. As we learn more about these sort of things, we'll be able to come up with uh, medicine that's a little bit better and longer lasting. Dopamine is going to influence movement, learning, attention, and emotion. And you can kind of see that some of these neurotransmitters bleed over into each other. So when you look at dopamine, if there's too much dopamine in a person, um, they will um, start to act and become schizophrenic. And remember, schizophrenia, they have a hard time paying attention to stuff because it's almost like their attention is just all over the place. They sometimes have inappropriate emotions, um, and sometimes their movement. Um, will also be off. Now, if you don't have enough dopamine, what we'll see is that tremors will start to develop. And when we start seeing that, we're, we're going to start seeing Parkinson's disease. So like Michael J. Fox with his Parkinson's disease research, um, this is stuff that like the medicine is trying to mimic dopamine to decrease those tremors and the constant movement that he can't control anymore.
Now serotonin is going to affect mood, hunger, sleep, and arousal. When you look at serotonin, it's associated always with your mood disorders and stuff. So serotonin, if you don't have enough of it, we can see de um, depression developing. Um, when you look at trying to cure depression or trying to fix depression, you can use a biomedical therapy like Prozac, Zoloft, um, these would be antidepressant medicine, medicines out there. Um, but what they try and do is they try and elevate your, serot your serotonin level in your body so that your body will be regulated. Norepinephrine is um, going to deal with alertness and arousal and what this one's going to do is if you don't have enough of it it can depress your mood so serotonin and norepinephrine these two um, neurotransmitters definitely deal with mood disorders and so a good antidepressant medication um, would deal with trying to raise your serotonin level and try and raising the norepinephrine level. For people who are bipolar serotonin and norepinephrine is definitely the issue um, and it's the same thing kind of really with our depressed patients. Now GABA is a major inhibitory neurotransmitter and what this means is if it's inhibited you're going to start seeing, um, if you don't have enough of it, seizures, tremors, and insomnia. And the reason why you're going to develop insomnia is that your body can't calm down enough for you to actually go asleep and stay asleep. Remember insomniacs do sleep, they just don't get into the REM cycle of sleep so they never feel truly relaxed. Now glucamate is another neurotransmitter that you need to know and if you look at it, it looks like glucose. So glucamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter and this one deals with your memory. If you have too much of it, like it, when you know kids have too much sugar, they're like crazy, they're all over the place and then they you know, pass out after 20 minutes of bouncing off the walls. It's the same thing with glucamate. Uh, if you have too much of it, it overstimulates the brain, it can cause migraines, it can cause seizures in a person. Um, typically people who do experience um, migraines, they need to stay away from MSG. MSG is just a salt um, that's typically found like in Asian food, but you can get it without it. Make sure you know that chart. Um, it's very important that you know it just for the simple fact that it's going to be on the exam. Epinephrine, I'm just going to go back. Epinephrine, if you take out this uh, N-O-R, if you take out that, the NOR part, just epinephrine itself is adrenaline. Uh, and that's another neurotransmitter. So lock and key mechanism. Neurotransmitters bind to the receptors of the receiving neuron in a key lock mechanism. So when the message is actually received, they lock onto each other and that's how you keep going. So agonists, these are just um, molecules that excite. So this is uh, agonists, it's just going to excite it. Um, like morphine, what morphine does is it kind of mimics um, endorphins and endorphins is another neurotransmitter that you might want to be familiar with and endorphins are kind of like your body's natural way of relieving pain and it's your body's natural way of relieving pain um, because your body can and so morphine what it does is it just mimics it. Um, antagonists, these are something that will block a neurotransmitter um, so what you can have is a antagonist trying to block uh, the reception of a neurotransmitter. Now the nervous systems, you need to know them. Um, remember with the packet that you were given, there was a, you know, how, how you need to break them apart, how you need to memorize them. So you get the central nervous system and the parietal nervous system. I'm sorry, the peripheral nervous system. So when you look at the nervous system, um, it looks at your nerve cells and you just need to know it, guys. You need to look at this uh, central nervous system and you look at the peripheral nervous system. So we're looking at, um, with the central nervous system, we look at the brain and we look at the spinal cord. And that's the easy one. With the PNS system, you're looking at sensory and motor neurons that connect your central nervous system to the rest of the body. So um, you should probably know this chart. Uh, we did it in your notes. This is just something that makes it easy for you to understand. And remember, you can kind of jot down these things um, in the test booklet when you get it to help you out. But remember, your answers have to go on the Scantron. So when you look at the nervous system, you have the peripheral and you have the central nervous system. In the peripheral, it's a little bit more complicated because you have the autonomic and the somatic and then from the autonomic nervous system, you actually have sympathetic and parasympathetic. Um, and we will look at this in part two of neuroscience.